Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about cognitive biases and oil exploration. How do you recognize them and how do we try to deal with them? Now, what is a bias? Now, this is um, inspired a little bit by a former boss of mine, a guy called Mike Bond, who's now with Rose Associates. He does an extensive course on biases and he blogs quite a bit about it. So, uh, this is a little bit of um, some of his ideas, some of other people's ideas all put together. So, biases. What are they? They're mostly subconscious beliefs that tend to skew our views, either positively or negatively. Biases can lead us to support and affirm evidence that's consistent with prior beliefs, something like, like confirmation bias, which I'll talk about a little bit later, or biases can lead us to ignore evidence which contradicts our prior beliefs. Biases can lead us to making poor decisions, such as choosing pushing pro projects or ignoring potentially good opportunities. So the results of biases can be quite negative because we can produce wrong analysis that can bias us to poor decisions, which can fall fundamentally into two different camps. The one that's most commonly affected is the overestimation, overestimation of volume, overestimation of chance of success. This can lead us to participate in bad projects, drilling bad exploration wells, making bad decisions on developing fields, or particularly when we poorly execute a project because we think uh, it's going to be a lot bigger than it really turns out to be, therefore build oversized facilities, therefore lose money. But it can also lead to underestimation, dismissal of potential opportunities. Example of that, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Egypt, there's the Zor discovery, which was made in 2015. This was made by ENI, one of the uh, Italian oil company, one of the best explorers of the last decade. And they were touting for partners for a long time because they didn't want to drill this at 100% equity, taking all the risk. Nobody said yes. So they drilled at 100%, they had the recontract anyway, you know, what have we got to lose? Came up with the biggest gas discovery in the last uh, 10 odd years. So biases can lead to underestimate potential opportunities, pass on things. So there are different types of biases that we could have. Um, they're all listed here and I'll go through some of them. Uh, anchoring, information bias, framing bias, status quo bias, authority figure bias, confirmation bias, etc., and perception blindness. The one at the bottom of motivational bias is probably actually one of the more significant ones, and I'll come to that last. So, overconfidence bias. This is when people have extensive confidence in their own abilities and correctness of their analysis. The Lake Wobegon effect. All of our children are above average. This leads to increased certainty. How can I possibly be wrong? And it also leads to ignoring contradictory information because admitting you're wrong can be psychologically difficult for some people. It tends to be more of an issue with uh, people who are more experienced and more prestigious, who have prestige, because if you have high prestige, admitting you're wrong might be a lot harder than it is for uh, someone who has uh, less prestige. So what can you do about it? Ask questions, listen to other opinions. And if other opinions make more sense than your opinion does, change your mind. When evidence changes, my opinion changes. Illusion of knowledge, kind of linked to the previous one. It's when you think you know more than you do. You know something, but not enough, and you extrapolate a heck of a lot. Uh, so, okay, what can you do about that? Well, admit what you don't know. Have a uh, difference between what you do know, for which there's very firm evidence, and what you're guessing, what you're extrapolating. Many paint them different colours on a map. And have a systematic review. You know, what are the real knowns, what are the real unknowns, and what are the unknown unknowns? And get people to ask questions and get outsiders to give you opinions. And listen to the answers, even if they contradict what you're going to say. Anchoring bias. We've got some evidence, therefore everything must be within 20, 10 or 20% of that particular value. So all the new information is look at the reference to the anchor, and if it's significantly different from it, you tend to question it. If it's similar to that, you tend to say, let's assume it could be correct. And you need to try to get a little bit away from that. Now, it's a very natural thing to do, particularly if someone gives you a proposition, and then uh, you tend to follow it. So again, try to get away from that. Information bias. Uh, so seeking information that does not uh, affect your planned actions. So something that gives you a nice, warm, comfortable feeling. Or let's do more studies anyway. Yes, it's, it makes things look okay. But more information is not always better. 
we can take a lot, a lot of time, quite a lot of money, quite a lot of effort to get the information, which may not change your future actions anyway, particularly if you're looking for information that's unlikely to change your future actions. So that's something to look at. Then there's a framing effect. This is more of an issue for people who are on the receiving end of the information, the decision maker. So if you're an exploration manager, someone's got a proposal in front of you, sometimes it's the way they frame it. Like the figure on the, on the, uh, on the right, 90% chance of success or 10% chance of problems. If you've got a 90% chance of success, you feel warm and fuzzy and positive, where someone gives you 10% chance of project problems, you say, what problems? Well, how's it going to work? What's the chance of it going wrong? So again, trying to look at both sides and trying to be objective. Not always easy. Availability bias. So this is quite often when you have the latest information and you assume that other situations will be just like it. An example of that in exploration was the Jubilee Field in Ghana, offshore Ghana. And people chased lookalikes for Jubilee all along the Atlantic Transform margin, both on the West African side and on the Brazilian side. And not many of them kind of worked. But again, you are looking for stuff that's like what you've seen before and you try to copy it. Trying to use analogs you're familiar with and assuming they work everywhere, trying to push things across. I mean, I remember once having a conversation with someone talking about amplitude versus offset and carbonates. It's really a classic technique, but the guy was from the Gulf of Mexico. That's what he was used to. That's what he was very good at. And he was moving to a completely new set of reservoirs that didn't really work with that technique. And overestimating the importance of available information because it's in front of your nose, it must be important. Well, is it? And also recent information over old information. You know, somebody may have done some work in 1985, but that might still be valid. So again, trying to disentangle that, not always easy. And this is one of the hardest ones, confirmation bias. Once people make up their minds, they kind of tend to stay make up. It's very difficult for people to change. So people will always look for stuff which validates their views, which confirms stuff. And they'll ignore or disbelieve information which challenges their views. You know, have consensus. Nice and warm, everybody says this. And also ideology tends to play a part in that. If you have a particular world view or cultural view, you look for information that confirms with that. And it's probably the hardest bias to deal with. And I don't know what the answer is, but it's something that people need to look at. The ostrich effect, dismissing information that contradicts established beliefs and asking difficult questions. And it's an issue with serious problems which quite often get involved, get ignored. No, we don't want to mention this. And contradicts in some situations something which I call the good news culture, where bad news gets punished. So people behave like ostriches or go in denial, you know, the big river in Egypt. Then there's the authority figure bias or the halo effect. Professor Wise says it must be uh, like this, therefore it must be true because Professor Wise is a very wise person. So a positive perception may be based on the views of the speaker, whatever the particular prejudices or uh, values would be. If the speaker is from your particular group or a group which has a lot of prestige or a speaker has a lot of prestige in themselves, um, people can give their views more validity than perhaps they really ought to be worth. Conversely, speakers without the halo will be given less credence. You know, young man or young woman, what are you asking this question for? And people from low prestige groups will be given no credence at all. They come from group X, therefore they cannot possibly have anything valid to say. Can be a very serious problem indeed. And then there's Hippo, or the highest paid person opinion. Now this was, um, I read about this in a, in a book by Matthew Syed, um, a British uh, author, uh, he did give credence to whoever it was, I can't remember who it was, but basically the highest paid person's opinion or the boss's opinion counts for a lot. In some cultures it counts for everything. So when the boss says something, everybody else supports them because they don't want to contradict the boss, perhaps even in private. Desire to curry favour, sycophancy, fear of damage of contradicting the hippo. So good news culture, messengers get shot. So if you are the hippo, if you are the highest paid person in the room, don't be like that, but be like that. Be a nice, calm, peaceful hippo and listen to other people because you pay them to talk. Motivational bias. Again, quite an important one here. What are the rewards or punishments of a particular outcome? What's motivating someone to go in a particular direction? 
So a punishment-based culture leads to caution. Remember an American guy called Jeff telling me a story uh, when he was a young man uh, working with uh, an Iranian guy who had just escaped from Iran. Now, the Iranian bloke uh, had drilled, um, his, the Iranian bloke's boss had drilled six successes, then he had a dry hole, now I told him shot him, the uh, Iranian bloke's boss. The Iranian bloke then thought, hmm, really don't want to hang around here, I better leave. So a punishment-based culture can lead to excessive risk-taking, excessive butt covering, in order to ensure that you don't get punished. Whereas a rewards-based culture can lead to excessive risk. For example, Enron. You took risks, you got rewards. Particularly if uh, the payoffs may take quite a long time and people may not know the damage you've caused for several years. There's also a group or clique think, where you would basically think like everyone else to fit in. Another potential danger. So, what are the potential risks and rewards for a project proposer? Does a person's job or career depend on the outcome? You know, if they've been pushing a particular project for years, uh, if they are seen to succeed in the project or get the project past the gate, they get promoted to the next level, always a big situation to look for. Or the financial rewards, for example, bonuses. There's a story of a field in the North Sea, which is developed by a small company. Uh, again, I don't know if it's exactly true like this, but apparently the geologist, the geophysicist and engineer at the time of discovery subsequently became the chief geologist, chief reservoir engineer and chief geophysicist of that particular little company. Therefore, they were directly motivated in getting the field approved because they got extra large bonuses and the field got approved and they were in charge of making the decision. Guess what? The field got approved. Guess what? The field conked out, stopped producing after about three years. The company lost a fair bit of money, but these people got significant bonuses. Now, again, I don't know if this is entirely true. That's exactly what happened, but that's how it can occasionally go. And glory and vanity. Let's be honest here. Geologists and geoscientists can be a bit on the vain side. I made a big discovery. I got this through. Me, 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 me. I'm important. That could potentially be a motivator and also personal validation. Yeah, it's really great when things that you do go right. Not so great when they don't, but uh, that could be a motivator for something to happen. So what can we do about this? First thing is, all of us have biases. We need to accept that, we need to recognize them. Difficult things to deal with, but at least if you admit that you've got a potential problem, you might try to solve it. You need to ask questions and you need to don't suit the messenger. Get more people to look at your stuff in a dependent review in a respectful way. And this can be quite challenging in many cultures. Again, start of solving a problem is recognizing that there is a problem. So biases ahead, look for that. So this was posted on Visual Capitalist, the website looking at all the different biases that were there. So thank you very much. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.